Ladies and gentlemen, I, Professor Lisa Ghosh, you very, very warm welcome for joining the session of the monthly online series hosted by Alice Rosses and is based on the theme Indo French Share Cultures. You'll be happy to know that our guest speaker for today's webinar, Susan Strong, is all set and ready to make an interesting presentation on an exclusive topic, namely the Pollier and Gentle albums at the Victoria and Albert Hall. I am extremely delighted our guest of honor, Monsieur Emmanuel Dagna, the counselor for education and culture at the French, who heads the French Institute and in an for the country director. Bonjour, Emmanuel Monsieur. Nous avons le plaisir de vous accueillir pour le cinquième webinar. Monsieur, organisé par l'Alliance Forces de Lucna. Monsieur, we are welcoming you wholeheartedly for the fifth webinar, webinar that is being organized by the Alliance Forces Lucna. Now, I thank you so for your precious time and for making this event more vibrant and memorable. Thank you, sir. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur. Now I'm sure your curiosity and enthusiasm is increasing by the moment. For I request you all, please pay a few minutes, just a few minutes, to introduce the process and you through a short video. Just five minutes and it will be done very soon. Do we have the video, please? I'm extremely sorry for the technical glitch. The sound doesn't seem to be coming on the video. I hope I am audible. Okay. So, uh, since the video is not working, I would just like to talk very, very, very short that our institution, that is Alias Hospital Lucknow, it's the youngest among all the alliances in India. And I wouldn't like to go to the details, but the main objective is to promote French language and spread awareness about French culture and French civilization. We offer different courses to different ages for a child, for the adults, the elementary course, the advanced course. And we also design industry-based courses and customized courses for different students depending upon their needs. This is about the course. And a very important news that I would like to share with you all is that Alias Rosas Lucknow will be starting, that Alias Rosas Lucknow will be starting the Delft A1 course with IIM students from tomorrow. This is the good news that I would like to share with you all. And we are also going to start our classes with the CMS school, our new institutional members 
who is the biggest, who has the biggest number of chains in India and abroad. It is one of the leading, largest populated schools with the number of chains of schools, branches as it is. Now, I would, before going further, I would like to request the counselor, Monsieur Lebrun, a seasoned diplomat of the French Foreign Services and was flagged off the first session of our monthly online webinar series to speak a few words and make this event more momentous and memorable. Monsieur Emmanuel Lebrun. Bonsoir à tous. Bonsoir, Madame la Présidente, chère Zora Chatterjee. Bonsoir, Madame la Directrice, chère Mita Gauche. Good evening yes, to all from Delhi. Um, it's wonderful to be joining you tonight. I'm delighted to attend this fifth talk of this series. And I remember I was there. I was very happy to um, inaugurate uh, this series in December last year. And it's wonderful to see that it goes so well and it attracts so many people and wonderful speakers around really very interesting topics. Uh, congratulations as well to the Alliance Française de Lucknow. I'm very happy to learn um, that IIM Lucknow and also CMS are initiating online French classes through your Alliance Française. Uh, you show us that you can be young, but very active and very professional. So it's really a, a pleasure to see the um, dynamism of this team. And uh, we are very uh, uh, glad to support you uh, from Delhi and you have all your place in the big family of Alliance Française in India. You're all waiting uh, to listen to our great speaker tonight. Uh, it's indeed a very important topic for us. You know, France was the cradle of the Enlightenment movement in Europe and it created great interest in Oriental cultures and it led to a trend for collecting and cataloging knowledge about these cultures. And the famous Frenchmen Jean T and Paulier, but also Claude Martin, were avid collectors, and I am looking forward to hearing about the part of their collections which are housed at the Victoria and Albert Hall today. So uh, without more making you waiting, uh, thank you all for organizing this series. Thank you very much, Mrs. Susan Strong, for joining us tonight, and I wish all of you a very good night. Thank you, Emmanuel. It's a pleasure to have you with us again. and. Uh, we really look forward to your support. We need to technically upgrade here. We need to do so many more things to become a stronger alliance. We are young, but we look to you for support to grow. Now, I would like to, with your permission, introduce the speaker today. This is Susan Strong. She's the senior curator in the Asian department of the Victoria and Albert Museum. She is a leading specialist in the arts of the Mughal court. With a career of four decades, which spans written lectures and broadcasts all over the world. She has a wide range of subjects at her command, covering jewelry, stones, and metalwork, and architectural ornament, stones, and the art of the book. Her major contributions are to national and international award winning exhibitions. She's written many books, including The Bejeweled Treasures, Tipu's Tigers, Made for Mughal Emperors, and The Art of the Book. We are looking forward to listening to you, Susan, and learning what V and A has from the great French collectors in our Jean T, Paulier, and of course, Claude Martin. Over to you, Susan. We look forward to your talk. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, good. Okay. Um, it's a great pleasure to be talking to the Alliance Française in Lucknow, and thank you for these very kind introductions. Um, I wish that we could all be together in the same room, but obviously that's not possible at the moment. But the upside of this COVID situation is that we can get together in from very different parts of the world all at the same time. 
And I wanted to introduce to you or, or reintroduce to some of you probably two albums in the v which are associated with the Mongol province of Awad. One was made for Antoine Paulier, the other for Jean-Baptiste Gentil, both very, very familiar names to you all. And both in very different ways shed really fascinating light on the interaction of these French speakers with Indian art and culture in the late 18th century. Now, the first one, it's not changing, just hang on, yeah. The first one was bought by the South Kensington Museum in 1858. And here I should explain to you that the South Kensington Museum was set up as a result of the 1851 Great Exhibition in London with the profits from this massive exhibition. And so in 1858, it was a very young museum. The museum changed its name to the Victorian Albert in 1899. So this is the same institution, but in its very mm. early days. And you can see the official acquisition details of this album, that it was bought in 1858. It was, uh, it was a manuscript, which the description says was in Persian. In fact, the uh, what it doesn't say is that it ha that it consists of specimens of calligraphy and the calligraphies are in Persian and in Arabic and the album is still in the library of the museum um, but it wasn't really recognized for what it was until very very recently in the last few years so from the mid 19th century to the early 21st century its connection with Polier was wholly unknown now, the calligraphies that I mentioned include three which are signed by the calligrapher Muhammad Ali, and this is one of them. It's dated, which makes it quite important, to the Hijri year 1198, 1783 to 4. But how did this album of calligraphies come to be in the V&A, and why wasn't it identified for what it was until very recently? So, although it was in the library, it was clearly examined by readers in the library, but nobody knew what it was. And it was only with the creation of a dedicated Middle East section at the V&A that the story starts to unfold. Now, the Middle East section was intended to join the existing Asian department, which then had a South and Southeast Asian section and an East Asian section. The rest of the museum is divided into departments based on materials. So we have a metalwork section, a sculpture section, textiles and so on. With the creation of the Middle East section, we brought anything from the Middle East together in this new department. And that's where the detective story begins. My then colleague, Behnaz Artagi Mokadam, was going through all the Persian and Arabic material in the library so that it could be transferred to the new Middle East section. And as a Middle East, as an Iranian art historian, she could see that the illumination on the first folio had not been done in Iran. It has no Iranian character about it at all, mm -hmm. but she thought it looked Indian. And the Persian inscription at the center of the Shamsa or Rosette just describes what's inside the, the uh, volume. And you can see that it's on a, a black flecked ground. Originally, this would have been silver, but it's become tarnished and looks black. But she showed it to me and instantly, I recognized it as a Polier album, which wasn't particularly clever or difficult because there are several of it. There are actually 13 albums compiled for Colonel Polier now in Berlin in the museums of Islamic and Indian art. And they have exactly similar shamsas. And the borders also are very distinctive. So it means that whenever these pages or whenever detached for, uh, pages from different albums appear on the art market, which they do from time to time, they're instantly recognizable. And you can see here the on the left is the V&A opening folio, folio with its borders. And on the right is a picture that appeared on the art market in London in 2018. And you can see the instantly you recognize them. They're not like anything else. So 
Polier, of course, is, is very well known to you at the Alliance Francaise in Lucknow. And here he is, man spreading in a famous painting now in Calcutta, in the company of the endlessly fascinating Claude Martin, with the painter Zoffany in the self portrait in the middle, and their friend, the Englishman John Woomwell. Just to remind you very briefly about Polier's career, Antoine Louis Joseph Polier was born in Lausanne. He came to India in 1758 and he enlisted as a cadet with the English East India Company. Now he worked for them initially as a surveyor and he was promoted to chief engineer in charge of reconstructing Fort William in Calcutta. And in 1772, he was assigned to the court of the Nawab Vizier Shuja Adala in Faisabad. He died actually in 1775 and uh, Polier continued to work there under the Nawab's eldest son, Asaf Adala. And Polier was his chief engineer and architect. And this equally famous painting of Polier in Indian clothes, watching notch dances, shows how easily these men move between their West and Audi worlds. Seemingly within months of his arrival, Polier was employing the preeminent artist Mir Chand, who painted this portrait of, of Polier. And over the next 13 years, the artist and his colleagues produced at least 13 bound albums containing examples of work done in Oud, as well as paintings produced in Delhi, combined with contemporary specimens of calligraphy and even 17th century Mughal and Deccani paintings. Albums exclusively of calligraphy are quite rare, then ours isn't unique, but they're much less usual than the albums which have paintings in them. And if you want to read about the, the career of Merchant and uh, painting generally in Lucknow, then I'd recommend the Los Angeles County Museum exhibition catalogue, India's Fabled City, The Art of Courtly Lucknow, with its very good essay by Marlene Roy. Now, when my colleague Bernaz brought the album to me and we were discussing it, we saw this inscription very lightly written in pencil on the back flyleaf, which explains how the museum acquired the album. And it says that it came from the, the sale at Dalesford House, which was the stately home built by Warren Hastings, the former English governor of Bengal from 1772, when he returned to England in 1785, embroiled in scandal. He died in 1818, but the house contents were sold at an extremely high profile sale in 1853. So it went directly, the album went directly from the sale, from the auction to the museum. But it's this very unobtrusive inscription that provides the key to unlocking the history of the album. It allows us to see the fundamental contradiction between the cultivated engagement of European men who were immersed in India's literary and, and religious heritage, its philosophies and languages, but, and what they got up to as servants of the English East India Company. Now, Hastings was based in Calcutta, and he was a very active participant in the intellectual circles of the time that famously included Sir William Jones, who founded the Asiatic Society early in 1784 in Calcutta. And Hastings was a founder member of the society, as was Polier. Both corresponded with Polier in Faisabad, and Jones sought Polier's help in acquiring manuscripts. Polier was a very, very active collector, as, as was, of course, Claude Martin and Jean T. But Hastings was also a close personal friend of Polier. They, they'd met many times before this. Now, against this background of genteel scholarly discourse, Hastings took some extremely controversial decisions in his role as governor general, particularly in relation to Raja Chait Singh of Benares, which at that time was formerly part of the province of Awad. And without going into detail, because it's not terribly relevant, Hastings demanded a huge war subsidy from the Raja. And when Chait Singh fell behind with his payments, the governor went to Benares to arrest him. 
widespread rebellions broke out. Hastings escaped, so it was very lucky not to be killed. And he ended up in Lucknow in, uh, in March, 1784, staying with Claude Martin. And he kept a diary, which is full of references to private conversations in Persian that he held with the Nawab and many references to days spent with Polier, including his last day where they spent the whole day together before Hastings left at night in the coolness of a moonlit night to return to Calcutta. And shortly after that, he left for England where he eventually stood trial for impeachment. But the two friends kept in touch and in one of Polier's letters from Lucknow to Hastings that I came across in the British Library, we have the answer to the mystery. He says in this letter, you'll see that his English, English grammar isn't perfect, he says, when you was last at Lucknow, I took the liberty of troubling you with a maraca, that's a, an album, of fine oriental writings for Sir William Jones. In the hurry occasioned by your departure, you forgot to send it, and he on his side omitted to remind you. I have since replaced this book with another I have given to Sir William, and I have now to request you will accept of the one you have by you as a small token, my gratitude and regard. So there we have it, mystery solved. The story of the album made for Colonel Jeanty, which is in the V&A, is very different indeed. The museum bought this one in 1979, and this time the curators knew exactly what they were getting. The, the, it was easy because Colonel Jeanty wrote copious notes on the entire album, little essays on many of the pages. And so when a dealer in rare books and oriental art sent photographs of the album to the V&A, suggesting that it might be of interest, the, the curators then took up the offer with, with great alacrity and keenness. And the, the album apparently was then in Paris, but it was brought over. And when it was examined, the museum decided to buy it and they paid 11,000 pounds for it in 1979. There's no mystery concerning the patron or the authors of the paintings because, as you can see, the patron himself wrote the opening statement. And he's saying that the, um, this collection of drawings was put together by, uh, on various themes representing the uh, manners and customs of the inhabitants of Hindustan. And it's also by two named, it includes works by two named artists, Navasilal and Mohan Singh. And wonderfully for our purposes, which I'll, I'll explain in, in a, shortly, it's dated and it was done in Faisabad in 1774. And this dating means that certain illustrations in the album are of extraordinary value to different aspects of art history. But you can see that um, Jeanty, of course, is again very familiar to you. Uh, just to recap briefly, he was born in France in 1726. He came to India and began his career with the French East India Company, the Compagnie des Indes Orientales, in 1752. And five years later, when the English East India Company were the victors at the Battle of Plassey, and the balance between these two competing foreign powers tipped decisively towards the British. He then changed course in his career. And in the early 1760s, he entered the service of Shuja Daula in Awad. And in the period leading up to the death of his patron in 1775, he employed a small circle of artists, including the two named in this album. And he returned to France in 1778, taking his collection with him. Much of it he gave to the king, and so it became part of the Royal Library, and then is clearly still part of the Bibliothèque Nationale. Now, Shuja Daula, as you know very well, was not only governor of the province of Aude from 15, 1753 to 75, but he was also vizier 
to the emperor Shah Alam II, hence his title Nawab Vizier. Relations between Delhi and Awad were very close, and especially after Nadir Shah of Iran made a devastating attack on Delhi in 1739, many artists and craftsmen sought new patronage in Awad, in the rising court, where they could be assured of very lavish patronage from the leading figures in this society, not just the Nawab, but the European circle that surrounded him. And indeed, one of Jonti's artists is known to have come from a family of hereditary Delhi painters. Now, as we can see, going back to the album, from this very stern notice at the beginning, it's been compiled with a clear intention that the album should be available to a wide audience. So there, this is the sort of notice that would be approved of by every museum curator, do not touch the paintings with your fingers. Um, but it also, the album reflects the very close relationship between Delhi and Aud, and it also alludes in its illustrations to the glorious lineage to which the now virtually powerless Mughal Emperor Shah Alam belonged. It begins with a list of the offices of state and the roles of those within the royal household before showing the most famous throne ever made for a Mughal emperor. And here I should explain there's a, there's a fundamental difficulty in showing the images from this album because it's got very awkward dimensions. It measures 37 centimetres high but 53 and a half wide and the drawings are absolutely minute. They're often like little cartoons. And so when you see a page like this, it's, it's not only difficult to project on the screen, but it's also difficult actually to display because the other folio, when you have a double opening, you have a lot of very blank paper, although some of the pages on the opposite sides are heavily annotated with, with um, comments by the patron. But this throne, as the caption said, was, the, um, uh, was made for at enormous expense for Shah Jahan. And it was very famous uh, in its own time. It, took, it was commissioned on Shah Jahan's accession to the throne in 1628, and it took seven years to produce. It became known as the Peacock Throne. It wasn't at the time, it was called the Jewel Throne, but later on it became famous as the Peacock Throne because on the canopy were two enameled jeweled peacocks. And so here you have a detail of this painting showing Shah Jahan sitting in the middle of the throne with the canopy on the top, which was enameled inside and enameled with um, Persian verses. So it was an absolute tour de force of the goldsmith's art. And it was actually designed by an Iranian craftsman who was the head of the goldsmith's department. But of course, by the time the album was completed, this splendid artifact had almost certainly been destroyed because Nadir Shah had invaded Delhi. He'd seized the treasury, took it back to Iran in 1740, and we don't hear of the peacock thrown ever again. And, but we do have stones which we know were famous and in the throne at the time, which circulated later. So it, was, it certainly was destroyed probably by this time. But the artists would have had access to very detailed written inscriptions in contemporary histories of Shah Jahan on which to base his, his depiction. Now, one very intriguing and very unusual painting from early in the sequence in the album is a scene of the women of the household of the Emperor Muhammad Shah, who ruled from 1719 to 1748. And of course, he was the one whose treasury had been pillaged by Nadir Shah of Iran. And after that, Mughal power began its long decline across the rest of the 18th century. But this painting is an absolutely extraordinary visual record of what happened when the royal women traveled because they were setting up camp in the countryside on an expedition and the women themselves are installing the tents. So within these red screens, red being the, the color of royalty, you can see women hammering in the tent pegs and just enjoying themselves in this enclosed space in the countryside. Um, but if we look closely, Jean very extensively 
selected the illustrations in the album, providing to identify individuals, buildings, and other key features. And for this paint says that number 10, the woman riding a white bull, is the mother of the emperor, Muhammad Shah. Now, he doesn't actually give her name here, but we know from many other sources that she was Fakhranis Begum. But he does name the emperor's wife, who's seen here in the middle of the country to the left, smoking a hooker, surrounded by female servants. She was Malika Az-Zamani. And so we have this sense of the women together doing all different things. Some of them are obviously about to set off hunting. They're holding falcons and guns. Some are bathing the waters. Some are musicians, some are preparing food and bringing it through. But it's a, it is a really extraordinary glimpse of this, what must have been a, a very pleasant space with its garden full of scented flowers and the musicians playing in the background. There are several depictions in the opening folios of the album of different types of romance, which is a regular theme of Vogel court painting but it's very notable that Jeanty often included him, himself included in the scene in these little, as I said, cartoon-like figures. And so in painting of a tiger hunt led by the Nawaz Jardola, Jeanty is present. But more than that, this is actually a, a scene which includes a detail of high drama. You wouldn't expect it from these little stick figures that are occupying this space. But if we home in, you can see on the elephant on the left, Jaunty in his distinctive hat. And in front, no, without the key, but this is actually the Nawab. And this detail is a very dramatic moment when the English Captain Harper, the elephant in front, had his elephant attacked by a tiger and the Nawab is shooting it. So this is, this is um, a rather interesting detail, of this otherwise conventional hunt scene. But you can see that, that I get a sense that some of it has quite a sense of humour. If you look at the depiction of the, the, um, the people on their horses in, in the foreground at the front, number six, they, they, there is a sense of amusement at these things in, in, on the part of the artist, I think. The next painting provides a glimpse of why Jeanty came to be so close to the Nawab. And here he is presenting French soldiers. And the notes explain that after 1760, when French power basically collapsed in India, many French troops had been forced to seek new employment. And the only employment that they could easily get was in the army of the English East India Company. They'd fallen on very hard times. But Jeanty came up with the idea of forming a corps of these French troops, and he presented 200 of them to the Nawab, who made them as a very useful force to the British. And of course, this was very carefully uh, thought out and intended. Eventually, here you have Jeanty at the center. If you can just see the number one, this is the Nawab on horseback with Jeanty approaching. Um, and Jeanty, under his care, the number of French troops went up to 600. And Jeanty's aim was to defend the Nawab against the British. Not surprisingly, this was an idea that didn't go down extremely well with the English company, who sent a demand to the Nawab that he sent to Calcutta. But the Nawab refused because he just couldn't do without Jeanty, so the matter was left. In another page, we see that Jean himself actually met the Mughal Emperor. Shah Alam was excluded from Delhi for years on end and, and was effectively homeless for a lot of the time. He was being persecuted at one time by the British and stayed several days within the borders of Awad. And Jean T notes in, in the album that the Emperor had heard of Jeanty and asked to uh, be asked that Jeanty be pre presented to him. So the Nawab brought the emperor to Jeanty's house, which was at the entrance to the Nawab's 
Garden, which is what you see here, the Anguri Bar, and Jean came out to greet them. And so here we have tea being presented to the Nawab, sorry, to the Emperor Shah Alam, who wanted actually to attract him to his court. But again, uh, Bob said that he couldn't do without him, so he refused to let it go. But here's Gentil presenting his, his Naz to the emperor, his, his do financial donation. Gentil was a witness to political events, um, and many of these involved negotiations with and the Nawab, and here is uh, the negotiations, the Treaty of Benares, and other activities um, earned in the titles that are on the seal that you may remember in the first image. These translate as uplifter of the state, leader in war, the valiant, and the council of kings, acknowledging his advisory role. And here, if we again zoom in, we see one of the, one of the uh, participants holding up a map. These negotiations were cruelly about land and who controlled it. But you can see that there's absolutely no differentiation whatsoever between the faces of the Westerners. They're, you know them, you identify them, you can't make out who the individuals are. And this is also true of, of the Indians depicted as well. The Nawab, however, is always recognizable because he's got this distinctive band um, around his turban, a cloth band which would have been embroidered and perhaps set with beetle wing fe feathers. And he also has a, a turban plume, a jeweled egg, and is an emblem of royalty, which by this time was being worn by regional rulers, not just the Mughal royal family. In the rest of the album, Jeanty echoes the great historian of the Ray Akbar. And this was a man called Abul Fazl, who was a polymath who'd been commissioned by Akbar in 1589 to write the history of the Mughal Emperor's reign. And he included in it as a huge third volume, a compendious account of the royal household, the empire, and all sorts of aspects of the lives, the beliefs of the inhabitants of Hindustan. And so this is echoed in, and Jeanty acknowledges this, that some of the areas covered by Abul Fazl in the late 16th century are also included in the album that Jeanty commissioned for himself. One of the most interesting articles that's been written on this aspect of the album is by a scholar called Chajalani, and her article, published by the Association of Art Historians in America in 2015, is called Transporting India, the Jeanty Album and Mughal Manuscript Culture. And she deals specifically with the legacy of Abul Fazl on this late 18th century album done for the Frenchman. But here we have, um, echoing Abul Fazl, a list of the officers of the royal household, and you can see, for instance, second left on the bottom is the Chubdar, the man who holds the, the tube, the stick, whose job to receive petitions at court and to keep. And all sorts of other people were involved, holding the royal staff, etc. Modes of transport. And the top level is the Khilat, different levels of. Um, presentation that were given by Nawab to favoured individuals. And these, as ever, across India were always carefully calibrated to the rank of the recipient. So the, the lowest ranks would just get perhaps uh, fabric, the highest ranks would get something which involved a diamond set turban plume, a sword and, uh, and very expensive cloth. And this is reflected in, in Abul Fazl's Aini Akbari, which Jeanty acknowledges in this. Um, there's a review of the beliefs of different religions, the different, fo the, sorry, the followers of different religions in India, Hindus and Muslims, he, he doesn't go any others, but again, following, as you can see here, drawn from the Aini Akbari of Abul Fazl the secretary and vizier of the Emperor Akbar, which isn't quite 
correct, but you know, roughly. And Dante's spelling, you can see here, is not perfect either. Um, but he has all sorts of details of these beliefs, which I'm, I haven't actually checked how close he is to Abel Fazl. But he also covers the system of the world as believed by the Muslims of India, where the world rests on the shoulders of an angel who stands on rubies. The rubies are resting on the multiple horns white bull which rests on a fish which rests on sand and water um, and so this again is very extensively annotated in the in the book. Al Fazl had also extensively covered the pastimes of Hindustan in his survey of the empire and this is reflected as well in Jonti's album but it also reflects at the same time contemporary life in Awad, in Faisabad and in Lucknow. And you can see the different sorts of fights which were... Let me just go forward. Different amusements which were enjoyed by the Mughal emperors, so um, common in Awad as well. And you will, I'm sure you all know the Colonel Mordant's cockfight painting. Well, here you see some cockerels fighting, but again, done with a touch of amusement, which with these giant birds, which dwarf the, the figures standing rather sternly next to them. But one of the things that is most important about the Jonti album, and these are the, the, the last few images that I'm going to show you, are the ones that most reproduce. As I said, it's difficult to, because the with scale of these paintings to reproduce them easily. But these last few pictures are documenting the jewelry that would have been worn in the, by the, the elite in 1774. So it's an incredibly valuable document because 18th century surviving jewelry or is only rare. And when we have it, we can't do it precisely at all. But here you, you see we have jewels of Indian women, and these range from hair ornaments to nose ornaments, bangles, uh, toe rings, finger rings, and so on. And these also reflect the surveys done by Abul Fazl in the Aini Akbari. Though it's very rare to have early copies of the Aini Akbari illustrated with such pictures. So this reflection of Abul Fazl and the documentation of the jewellery is incredibly valuable for students of Indian jewellery. And he also uh, recorded the arms of the, the time. Again, we, we don't have much information which allows us to date weapons very closely. I have these details of male jewellery, which is extremely rare. And so in here we have, at the bottom of that page, you'll see bottom left, this is the bit that's being reproduced at a bigger scale. You have jewels for women, which shows the emerald and ruby set bracelets and um, ornaments and pendants that have been worn. Also a reflection at top right of enamelling. And of course, Lucknow was famous for its enamel. Um, and then this jewels for men shows the turban jewels that would have been worn by the elite of the court and also the earrings that of a form bottom right introduced in in the early 17th century, but was still being worn. And necklaces that were worn by the Nawab also have been presented to very favored senior residents. So all this is an extraordinary document for the history of jewellery in India in the late 18th century. And here we have the detail of the weapons. If you look in the middle, the left, in the middle layer, tier, you have these punch daggers, which are, again are impossible to date because they are of a form which goes back centuries and was still, they were still being made in the 19th century. But this does, partly to date some very closely related examples. And you have different forms of maces, different forms of arrows and quivers and so on. So extremely valuable in art history terms in its own right, but also going into other areas of art history. 
And so I'll finish there with this very quick romp through two albums. But if you want to follow up the images that I've seen today and see many more, you can find them here on the VNA website under Search the Collections. And that and many, many more things in, in our collection. We add to it all the time. And we've just introduced a new facility which allows us to take comments. So if you find anything wrong, you can record your remarks and let us know and at some point we, as soon as we can we will change them and update them but it's not a static um, part of our website we're constantly upgrading it and correcting it and adding new images so thank you so much for your question that was wonderful susan uh, such an insightful uh, talk by you and we were so delighted to see the lovely uh, slides that you have prepared uh, from the VNA uh, uh, Museum. Uh, we are also privileged to have Dr. Selvam uh, Torres, who's a historian himself and also a director of uh, Alias uh, Francais in Dhaka, Bangladesh. He probably has some questions, so may I request uh, Dr. Uh, Selvam, to please uh, unmute your mic and uh, ask your question. Hello, can, can you hear me? Yes, very yes. Good. Please go on. Yes. So, yes, thank you. And I'm very happy to to the meeting and that uh, thank you. And I'm very happy also uh, to talk. Uh, uh, I would like to greet uh, Mr. Strange. Uh, I don't know if you remember. Um, uh, of course I do. So, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, some years ago, and uh, and I, I'm still uh, I'm still um, following uh, your research, and uh, uh, I'm thinking, uh, enjoying uh, every um, every uh, new publication about uh, Mughal, and especially about a uh, uh, painting. So of course uh, I uh, remember that uh, I have studied uh, it in um, from your website. Uh, yes, maybe uh, the question I, I would have uh, would be to you uh, uh, because you you showed the woman um, uh, the woman uh, in the garden and uh, maybe I didn't notice clearly. Uh, you think the, the painting that shows some the the scene is made from uh, Hamidabad from uh, sorry Halhabad or. Uh, according to you. Well, can I turn the question back because it's your speciality, not mine. <laughs> <laughs> this is a painting like which I was preparing to talk. It stands out because it's so totally different from anything else in the album. It's, it's mm -hmm. fully painted, it's a different an earlier period. And it made mm -hmm. me wonder, is this that's been incorporated? Or is it something that's been copied? Or is it, I couldn't explain it to myself. So I'm delighted to have someone like you who actually knows this period of, what What do you think about it? Well, I think uh, I the background of the painting, at the background of them, it's like a wooden uh, building and it's very, um, uh, uh, very precise because we, we can find it in several paintings uh, from probably dated from the end of um, the, the um, 50s uh, or the big and, um, some of them are signed by uh, Nidamal so you know mm -hmm. Nidamal was mm -hmm. a daily painter uh, to look no so I was wondering uh, I tried to find some uh, who could uh, who could look being uh, still today still uh, still know fine uh, but I think it's it should be in, uh, according to the other paintings I could uh, find uh, I think it could be in Lucknow but I'm I, I think it would be interested interesting to uh, to look uh, more building and uh, maybe it's a very particular particular building. Only, uh, only building in uh, in uh, Lucknow and not in. Don't think so. But let's mm. see. If I have well, no, this, news this about a, that, this, this is a challenge to the Alliance Francaise and hunt that. Yes. 
<laughs> yes, exactly. Do you think it related with the album? Do you think? Yes, I think so. Uh, yes, I think so. I think so because we are we are that in several paintings uh, which can be dated from uh, that period. So I think so. Yes. Thank yes. you. Excellent. Yes, thank you, Doctor. That's my. Uh, thank you, Doctor Chore. It calls for uh, homework for us in Lucknow to search for it. <laughs> and it's another thing. Thank you. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. Due to lack of time and the evening lockdown, which is starting in some time from now and will go on for the weekend in Lucknow, we uh, may not be able to take a uh, lot many questions individually. But uh, you are always welcome to send uh, your questions on our email, which is lucknow at afindia.org. And Susan will be happy to answer those uh, questions via email. Uh, we are also happy to have uh, Alice Gouni from Institute uh, France at the French Embassy in uh, Delhi. Uh, may I request uh, Alice uh, to please say a few words of encouragement. You've always been encouraging uh, for the Lucknow Center. Good evening, So, a pleasure to listen to different, uh, the different webinars. So, I've been following this one and it was really uh, amazing. Uh, and uh, fortunately, I think I know more about Lucknow through the webinars than <laughs> just being able to come because. Uh, we could not make it this time uh, for the Delft examination, but we do hope that we can uh, come back and uh, continue supporting uh, the Alliance Française Lucknow uh, in the coming uh, months and years. So thank you uh, all for a wonderful event. Madame um, is strong. Thank you uh, also for this wonderful presentation. Thank you, Zora and Nita and uh, Pratik, all the team there uh, for continuing despite all the odds, <laughs> which are quite uh, strenuous at the moment. And good luck for the lockdown in Lucknow. Thank you, Alice. Uh, it's always, it's, uh, always uh, we are happy to have you on our webinars and you always ensure that you are present in each one of uh, them. Um, now it's a matter of pride for me to propose the vote of thanks uh, for this webinar. And on behalf of uh, Alias uh, Francais de the, the Lucknow, I thank you, Susan, first for such an insightful session on Polière and Jonti at the, the Victoria and Albert Museum. It was indeed uh, 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 an, an eye-opener for us that we did not know that such uh, things exist in uh, Victoria and Albert Museum. And that calls for a visit, you know, when things normalize, we are sure that whoever has watched it, uh, he'll be there. I'm also happy to inform Susan uh, to you that we have 50 guests attending the Zoom meeting and 112 guests on our social media platforms who are watching this, which is one of the highest numbers we have ever had on uh, any of our webinars uh, till date. Uh, we are thankful to uh, Mr. Emmanuel Lebron Damian, Councillor for Education, Science uh, and Culture at the Embassy of France in India, uh, who is a great source of encouragement and guidance uh, to us always. Thank you for being with us today, sir. Uh, Mrs. Zora Chatterjee, uh, our president, is actually the one who conceptualized this series of webinars, and we are into our fifth webinar uh, today. And uh, she personally oversees each one and manages all of it wherever she is. At the moment, she's uh, in Delhi, but she's uh, managing it from there. And every moment she is in touch with us to see that everything goes well. Thank you, ma'am, for uh, giving all uh, of us an opportunity to enrich ourselves uh, and uh, with such slices of hidden slices of Indo-French uh, history and culture. Uh, thank you, Alice, to you for uh, being with us uh, in each of our webinars and especially guiding Lucknow Center in these very difficult times for survival. Thank you, Alice. I also thank our very able director, Professor Meeta Ghosh, and our administration in charge, uh, Vivek Pant, for seamlessly coordinating this webinar every time. Above all, uh, to all the students and uh, attendees who have joined us, our guests, 
who have been encouraging us with uh, in huge numbers they join us and uh, uh, do and i'm sure that they have enjoyed listening to susan is strong and uh, it it has been insightful uh, session for everybody who has attended it we have the recording we, which we will post on our facebook uh, page as well for those who have uh, not been able to be with us uh, today to attend this uh, webinar last but not the least thanks to the media for the wide coverage that they always give next day after each webinar that we have had so messi thank you everybody wishing you all a safe weekend those who are in india we request them to be at their homes be safe and pray that we come out of this dreadful present wave of covid thank you very much everybody